There we go. Uh, currently, Sue is an instructor for the in the UCLA Graduate of Education program. She holds the highest career win percentage in NCAA Division I softball history, 835. So that basically means for every 100 games they play, she's winning 83 games, which is, which is amazing. More national championship titles, 11, than any other person in NCAA Division I softball history. USA national team coach, world champion player, uh, and she she player she's a player and she coached 15 Bruins softball Olympians. That's more than any other school in the history of the sport. She's in six Hall of Fames as a player and a coach, which is so incredible to think. Because most time or a lot of times people are in a Hall of Fame as a player or people are in a Hall of Fame as a coach. You rarely get somebody who's in a Hall of Fame for both. Um, and uh, she's currently a high performance consultant for Fortune 100 companies. And she's on the staff of the USA volleyball team, which will travel to Tokyo this summer for the Olympic Games. She's also the founder of OneSoftball.com. It's a free online community for parents, players, and coaches. It's really changing the world of softball. And once other sports kind of, you know, get their stuff together, realize that what this can do for other sports. And she's a former pro surfer who's in the water every day. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. So, oh, before that, sorry is that there will be opportunities for questions. If you have questions as we go, please fill up the chat. There are going to be little breaks in Sue's conversation. Um, and we'll have an opportunity for a quick little question if there's some good questions in the, in, in the chat. If not, we're going to do some Q&A at the end. So with that, Sue, it's all yours. Jimmy, that was uh, such a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to see you. Thanks for having your cameras on. And for those of you that are in your pajamas, that's okay. No judgment. Um, I just want to first tell you what I'm not. I wasn't picked first. I read from the special books in elementary school. I was told by my senior academic counselor I would never make it at UCLA um, in front of my parents. And the reason I always want to share that is I really, when I reflect on my life, I really think I'm an ordinary person that had the opportunity to live a pretty extraordinary life because of a few pillar things that I did, a few anchor things I did throughout my life, not always the right way. Uh, today is really about sharing with you things that maybe can help you get more clear on your own values, your own personal brand, how you transition to a professional brand, how your brand changes over time, and then also giving you some information around leading teams because you're all going to become Chapman grads, so you're going to be leading. There's no doubt about it. If you're Chapman, you got to be a leader. Hello, duh. We know that already. And then last, to just give you some framework to make sure no matter where you traverse in your life, that you're always hyper aware that we should be reflective consistently in our life to make sure that we're staying grounded because I'll have some stories about when I wasn't grounded. And then what we'll do is we'll have a, a stopping point and so as I'm speaking and you have like a question, you want to throw it in the box, throw it in the box and Jimmy will uh, kind of like be a little moderator as I move through it. I find Q&A is much more interesting, I think, than having somebody, you know, blah, 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 blah at you. So I encourage the Q&A. You can put me on the hot seat. Uh, there is no such thing as an inappropriate question. And uh, I just look forward to sharing with you. I want to congratulate you already um, because you are at an institution that is, for somebody that's been in education for decades, Chapman University has such an incredible reputation. And so I want you to remember one thing. On your worst day, you can always just remind yourself, put that feather back in your cap that just don't ever forget that you're coming from Chapman and eventually you'll be a Chapman alum. So on that note, I, I wanna share with you a little bit about my story, but 
really I'm more interested around the stuff that stuck with me throughout my whole life. Um, I'm 63, so more of my life is behind me than in front of me. So it's a really, a, it's a wonderful place to be because I have complete control over my life, which is really fun. And it's also a time in your life where you're like, whoa, I better like, I better check myself. Cause you know, as my brother likes to say, both my parents are in heaven, God rest their souls. But my brother likes to remind me that we're on deck. So we better get our stuff together. Um, but more importantly, I hope I present to you um, an example of how, if you're intentional around who you are, what you wanna do and why you wanna do it throughout your entire life, that simple set of questions, who am I, what do I wanna do, why is that important? It helps be an anchor as we go through all this craziness uh, called life. And especially you all, cause you get to go through it um, during a pandemic. You get to go through it when our country is experiencing, you know, huge systemic racism. And unfortunately, those are lots of downers, right? And so I just want you to know, uh, college is supposed to be like the fun zone and books break out, right? And so my heart goes out to you that there's a little bit of melancholy, but, um, if I know one thing about students in that 18 to 23 year old age group, you can find fun in the most amazing places. So I have a lot of confidence that you're bouncing, you're bouncing back and forth between good work and also um, enjoying yourself during this crazy time. So I'm a daughter of a military father. So I have a strong influence around very authoritative vertical leadership. My father uh, had extremely high standards, but not high standards in terms of results, high standards in terms of process and high standards around failure recovery. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about failure recovery because our life is full of failure. And so for me, having a father that really paid attention to how I recovered, and he always said to me, be first up, after failure. And that really resonated with me. As I went through school, I always wanted to be the one that could recover the fastest. I would be the one that would try not to be as disappointed about whether it be grades or a report or a ball game. And so that's more of the strict side of me. And then I'm, I'm also a daughter of a nurse. So my mom was a nurse. And so, and we know nurses, right? Um, anybody that has frontline workers in their family or healthcare. My heart goes out to all of you. Thank you for your service. Um, but nurses are like, you know, they all have one foot in heaven, right? They are amazing people. So I felt like I had this wonderful meshing of having grace, understanding I haven't walked in other people's shoes, um, being raised by that balance afforded me an opportunity to really focus on process oriented character skills. And so when it comes to your own brand, everyone will talk about, um, you know, make sure you get clarity on your values. But at your age, you, you may find a lot of things you're like, oh, that, that could be my value. I like that. I, that's my value. I like, like that. I like that. I like that. And I always uh, like to share with students that it's okay if you've got a lot and it was somewhat difficult to pare them down when you go through those activities. I talked to Jimmy about what you had been doing. He said that you had gone through that exercise. But I also wanna remind you, if you don't have uber clarity, your values sit also in your day-to-day -day behavior around things that drive you nuts. So think about the things that you complain about with your family, with your friends, your co-students, that is uh, a way to be heightened around things that you value are also things that you have a tendency to complain about. And that is because 
you're aware of it and you value it when people don't do it. So those of you that still struggle with, gosh, I just can't get uber clarity around that, maybe flip it and ask yourself, wow, what do I notice about things, about life, about people, about processes that do kind of like get under my skin? So that's like a quick little tip um, there. For me, my core tenets around my, my values really sat in being the person that was going to work the hardest. I took great pride in coming early and staying late. I wasn't the biggest, the strongest, the smartest. So I knew that was going to be part of my process. And the other one was, and that influence came from my, this influence came from my mother. I wanted to be the person that really could give energy every day. That was something I took great pride in that I think the easiest thing in the world is to go into a tough situation and be Captain Obvious, right? Like, oh, look, it's raining today. The ball's going to be wet and coaching softball. And I always was the person that wanted to have our student athletes understand that, yeah, this is a tough situation, but let's be really great in plan B. So that was who I was as a person. And so when you talk about core values, your, your individual core values, you're going to find you will be more consistent as a leader if you hunker into those core values as you go through each different part of your life. Where it gets difficult, I think, for individuals is when they blow in the wind, they don't really know what they stand for, so they get into this job or they're working with this company, they don't have values, they cut corners, maybe they cheat, you know, game the system. And then what happens is, as you go through your life, the best version of you doesn't really come out. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, you know, Jim, I didn't know if you wanted to, I'll, I'm gonna do a quick screen share and uh, just let you know where we are in the presentation. I'll start with my own brand. I'll go into uh, the professional brand, then the leadership, and then we'll finish with uh, making sure you have a framework to always kind of check on yourself as you develop as a professional. Um, throughout your life. So I'm going to, let me just go ahead and grab your screen there. Let's see here. We good? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. good. Perfect. So really today is just about, it's about excellence that I, I think at this time of your life, there is so much around results. You know, I've got to get the A, I've got to get the 92%. You know, and I think what you're going to find uh, for me, I was always encouraging students to strive. Yes, the, the, the W is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I'll have stories about how I got caught up in the W's. The A's are awesome. But if I could, my goal today, when I'm done sharing with you, if I could convince you to be fanatical about the process, I think I can lessen the anxiety that comes with being a high performer or being a perfectionist. And if you're at Chapman University, I know for a fact, I'm going to, I'm going to profile you all that you're high performers and you take great pride in your results and the work that you do. But I'm going to be here today to convince you to fall in love with the micro behaviors, fall in love with the little things that hold hands that create big things and eventually results, which we can't control. Can't control the W. We can only control the path to the victory. Can't control how, you know, Professor Ducere gives you that grade. You can't control him. You can only influence him on your process. So that's something I hope that um, number one, that you're gonna to start to fall in love with the process even more. Number two, that you have a little bit of a hop in your step that life is crazy, but let's be great in the clown car. We're kind of in a clown car. Like I honestly feel like if I'm 20 in college, living on Zoom, I'm packed into this Zoom screen. It's like, where are we going? We're all packed in like the clown car. And if you don't know that adage that axiom it's really what it means is there's just a ton of craziness in one car and we don't even know where it's going 
but I know where you're going. And then last, I hope you feel like you have a contact. And for me, it's extremely important to be humbled by the people that lifted me up throughout my career. And I hope you feel a connection. And as you go through your life, I hope you can always have me in your back pocket. So that's gonna be our plan today. So we'll go person, brand, teams, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about scorecarding excellence, meaning scorecarding yourself as you go through uh, your life. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I love this saying that says, we don't have to please everybody because you know we're not, we're not tequila. And uh, I love that saying, not that you know everybody's boozing, I don't want to infer that, but this idea every single day when we go into life that we have a tendency to look left and right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince you to look inward and always take your own inventory. So for me, I kept it simple. It was about effort and attitude. Those were the two driving processes that I live with every single day. People are like, oh, see, that's kind of simple. It was kind of simple, but I had a super high standard around doing those things at a high level. And what impacts your values is how you think, speak, and act. So everything that you do around your values, they sit in those three areas. Your values are turning in your head, how you think, how you think about yourself, your work, your class, your environment, your family. Your words get impacted by how you think. So how I'm formulating how the world, how I see the world through my lens is gonna be driving what comes out of my mouth. And then those two things together are going to create the behavior that I have each and every day. So as a person, my individual brand was I'm going to be hyper aware of understanding my strong voice. Everybody has a strong and weak voice. Science now tells us we can document that. We now know if you think about it, you've got that internal talk track. Have you ever really started to evaluate it? And so I'm going to ask you when you talk about thinking, speaking, and acting, how many times are we sitting down and evaluating our self talk? Our self talk is building neural pathways in the brain. So if you're negative, you're hard on yourself, it creates a larger pathway of negativity. So the brain gets better at being negative. Same with the idea of having positive self-talk. You've heard a lot about the importance of doing that, but how much every single day are we evaluating what's going on up there? I'm gonna ask you even a deeper question. Would you date your inner voice? Like think about how you talk to yourself. Would you date your inner voice? I'm like, oh, heck no. And so I'm gonna challenge you today is start to be more aware of how you're talking to yourself. Be more aware of the narrative about your own brand. It's okay that you're not first. It's okay that you don't have uber clarity about your career. I mean, if I'm graduating from college right now, the opportunities you have because of entrepreneurship, all the op opportunities through digital. I mean, for me, I could understand why you may not have uber clarity on that. And give yourself a pass and tell yourself, hey, that's okay. It's okay that it's not real clear. And I'm gonna ask you to remind yourself every day of all the inventory you have, you have acquired to get to this point in your career. How many times do we take inventory of all the things you've done, all the sacrifices that, think about all the sacrifices you had in high school to be able to do the work you did that allowed you to get into Chapman University. So I want you to be aware of that strong and weak voice. And you have to understand the strong voice has to get the last word. So there are gonna be moments where you have pressure. You gotta remind yourself, I gotta fill up my inventory of my positive self-talk. It is critical science now backs that. High performers, you'll see them speak to that, even though they're perfectionists, they do a great job of pulling in that talk track around their inventory. So how I think, speak and act is incredibly important. The words that I use to build this micro value of awareness, to be aware of 
what does the room or the environment, what are they asking of me as my individual brand? You're either in a me environment, very rarely does that happen. The minute you leave your house, you're usually in the we called life. And I always tell students to put in the back of your mind, the doorknob rule. The doorknob rule is every time you're gonna open a doorknob, normally, not in a pandemic, that doorknob on the other side is an environment. Is it about me or is it about we? And that awareness is important because that's gonna affect what kind of comes out of your mouth. So you come into that environment, ooh, I'm in my team environment. Now I've gotta make sure what does the environment need? Do they need me complaining about what a tough day it was? Probably not. And so how you speak, how you act is a vibration on other people in life, on teams, in families. And so if we could be aware of that personal brand around how I think, speak and act. And so um, I wanna get back to uh, giving you insight from a, from a uh, experienced person's perspective. I wanna give you some insight. When you can get comfortable talking about failure, talking about your own failure, taking responsibility for your failure, it's going to allow you to be a better performer. And so I'm going to encourage you to think about this concept. For some of you, it's going to be a new concept, but this was, allowed us to be very successful when I went into my professional life. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Was this idea that Success and, and, and failure, they actually hold hands. You can't have one without the other. So this idea that I am going to try to shove fear in the closet because society has romanticized this whole concept around be fearless. We're going to we got to charge out there. We're going to be fearless. You know, they're interviewing you in the post, you know, postseason, and you, you, know, you got CBS in one ear and you got ESPN in the other ear. And there's this romanticizing around, oh, we went to the next level and everybody played their game and we clutched up and we were where we needed to be. No one's asking us about how we were like a goat rodeo all year. No one talks about the ups and downs and ups and downs. And so as a person, I want you to think about how you can get better at managing failure like you manage success. And it, it happens as a person. And once I was able to look at these two equally and respond efficiently the same way, I became a better performer as an individual. So I want you to think about failure is not a bad thing and having anxiety. There may be people here that have performance anxiety. Like maybe you have like extreme um, symptoms when you have to go do a pitch, you know, congratulations. I had a chance to sneak a peek on some of those pitches that you did. I, I just thought that was like unbelievable. Um, it, it was amazing. Dogwa, um, and and what was the other one? The 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 dollar store, like unbelievable. You guys were outstanding. So congratulations on that. But if you do have anxiety, or you suffer from mental health, I want to share with you as a former coach. We're going to talk about the professional brand next. As a former coach, we had consistently dealt with people that have performance anxiety. It's something you manage it. It's like having a bad Achilles heel. You got it. You got to manage it. Never really goes away. You got to manage it. Um, and we had people that had mental health issues. I had 15, coach 15 Olympians, the best in the world. We were gold medalists. And we had four of them that had to manage serious mental health. So anybody that's tackling any of that, I want you to exhale. Like, whoo, I thought it was me. I want you to exhale. And be okay with that. And then hopefully through this, I can share with you some things that can help keep that in check so it doesn't run you and run your life. So Jim, the main things that I really wanted people to understand was the clarity around the things that are important to me and my values have to do with the things that I really pay attention to and that really set, set me sideways. You know, the things that 
I, I, I complain about. Number two is once I know my values, I don't want to get hung up on the results in my life. I want to get hung up on the process. Who I am is going to drive a type of process, whether it be schoolwork, whether it be working in a company, but who I am is going to drive my process and then the results take care of themselves. So from this day forward, maybe we won't think so much about the results. Um, those were some really thing, things that allowed me to just get a little bit better each and every day and had a mantra when my, my toes hit the floor, I just need to get 1% better today. I'm not going to worry about the people to the left and the right. So I want to press pause and see if there are any questions, uh, Jim, uh, uh, from the class. Any questions to this point in the chat? I just have, uh, I think Mag Maggie said, hell no, that she would not date herself. Uh, Harper, somebody had a pipe burst in their house. They would. Lucas, go ahead. You can in introduce yourself, uh, name, major, and question. Hi, uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a sophomore screenwriting major with a minor in advertising. And uh, my question is, what are some qualities you see in your athletes that you coach? your most successful athletes uh, that you feel are necessary qualities for anyone to achieve success in any field? Yeah, uh, we're, well, let me answer. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Uh, and we're going to get into um, the coaching aspect and the leadership aspect. But I want to tell you from an individual level, here are the things that separate them. They don't sit in failure. They're first up after failure. When you talk to high performers, they have an attention to detail, but more importantly, they take failure almost like a roadmap. So they learn from their success, but they take failure as a roadmap. What, what, they break it down so they don't get stuck in their failure. That's number one. Number two is they have a heightened sense of awareness around everything they're doing in their life that is tied to their craft. So high performers, where they're different, where they separate themselves from average people, average people are in love with the light switch theory. The light switch theory says, I will turn the light switch on and become a great performer. And so the light switch would be, I'm a screenwriter. I don't need to do anything until the 11th hour. I'm going to switch on my creative and I'm just going to bang it out. So this attention to detail and the connection that everything is connected. So as athletes, how they think, speak and act, the decisions they make after hours, the awareness of what they need to do and those around them need to do. And gosh, if you could, if you could learn one thing is to master failure recovery, you're gonna separate yourself when it comes to becoming an employee or a business owner. Great. Thank you. Um, Kate, 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 you've got a good question. I do. I think Jim was hoping I would ask this question. What is your favorite surf spot in Southern California? Oh, well, I'm really lucky. I live in San Clemente and my brother has a home in Cypress Shores. Sorry, everybody leaving you behind right now. But there is a, a private beach called Cotton's Point. It's about 100 yards north of Trestles, which is one of the most popular beaches. So I surf every day at Cottons. I was in the water two hours ago, um, three hours ago. And so that's my, that's my favorite place. And that's my, my happy place because I love surfing because all different backgrounds, you could have a president of a company and you could have a fourth grader right next to each other. And I just love that all we're doing is talking about the ocean, talking about the tide, talking about the surf. So uh, those of you that have never done it, I strongly encourage you try it. I, I'm very jealous of that area. I grew up going to Trail 6. Um, oh, nice. There. So also, I love the painting behind you. Oh, My background, you. there's a surfboard I oh, broke nice. in right there. So. Nice, nice. Kate and I are just going on 1v1. Sorry, everybody. But Kate, I love it. <laughs> I appreciate the question. Perfect. And I think there's a one more. I think, oh no, Taylor, Taylor loved the question, Kate's question, because I think Taylor surfs down there as well. Oh. Nice. I'll keep an eye out for you all. <laughs> Perfect. I go left, riding a 6'2 right now. <laughs> Perfect. White. So I think, I think that's all the questions for now. And we can, we can we'll, we'll pause after, at the next pause break. Great. Um, when I talk about the brand, what I want to try to share with you, if you could remember one thing, um, if I'm losing you, come back in for just 30 seconds. Uh, we know that uh, 
of this is difficult. So sometimes I'm just going to try to pull you back in if you're starting to stray. If you could remember one thing, that if you if you want to be a true influencer, you can fake it in the short game. You can actually get away with it. But when it comes to the long game, it's going to come back and bite you in the butt. And so I know for, for me, throughout my career, I had so many crossroads where I got full of myself, where I got so overconfident with my team, where I negated my foundational principles around my process. And it eventually caught up with me. And for me, when I talk about your, your brand and mine is going to go from a player performer to a coach. That was my first professional brand. And then I went into administration and then went into being a professor and then went into being a business owner. But the most important story I want to share with you is a lesson around when your role changes, your brand your professional brand changes. So let's say you graduate from Chapman and now you're a sales associate. You got now you got a sales brand on. Then you're going to move up the ladder and you're going to be a manager. Now instead of following somebody you're leading. As all your brands change, your values shouldn't. And so I encourage you to be mindful about Am I really good? Am I really loyal? Am I really committed to my values? This is a wonderful time to commit to your values because you can work on it and there's not a lot at stake. You're not, most of you aren't supporting the whole family or have children and have a lot of financial risk happening. So use these months, use these years to really fine tune your brand when it comes to maybe, you know, I've heard a gentleman talking about he's, he's going to be doing a summer job. The day you walk in is your professional brand, even as an intern. And how do you want to be remembered? What do you want them to say about you? And most people, I can synthesize, synthesize it down into a couple sentences. I don't care if you're running a Fortune 100 company or you're running your little brother's 12 and under little league. They want a leader that believes and sees them for who they are as a person first. This person has put in the work ethic to know their craft. They've created the conditions for their co-employees or the people that uh, are working for you to deliver what the group needs. So they become an almost like a conductor. They become a transformative leader and not a transactional leader. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But this idea of being a leader isn't about, I'm gonna to get to the top and then I'm gonna tell everybody what to do. And for me, I did that. I worked really, really hard to get to a position to be the head coach of UCLA softball. And I can remember we were very successful and I just really lost my way. And I'll never forget if I could, Jimmy, I'm just gonna tell a quick story. Sure. I'll, I'll keep it short. I mean, it's, it, I can turn this thing into a half hour story but I'm gonna make it a short one. The bottom line is we were ranked number one. We were defending champions. We were in a tournament. I got caught looking at the shirts in the other dugout, got caught looking at the opponent. Remember, we don't wanna compare we don't want to look left and right. We want to stay focused on our work. Got caught looking I'm like, oh, little sisters of the poor over there. I don't even need to worry about warming up my second pitcher. We ended up losing. And I was at a point in my time at my life as a coach that I was so full of myself that I just couldn't believe we lost that game. It was totally my fault. I didn't have my backup pitcher ready because I got caught looking at the shirts in the other dugout. And we lost that game and we got, got the consolation trophy and I wanted no part of that. And I threw the trophy in the trash can in the dugout. Talk about clueless. And so, you know, you can, 
<laughs> you can Google Sue Enquist in all, oh, she's so wonderful. Oh my gosh, she's amazing. But if you Google Sue Enquist trophy trash, watch what comes up. So I share that story with you because if you remember one thing, come back in if I've lost you. You are at a point in your life where you're going to have what I call bell ringing decisions where you can't unring the bell. Sue Enquist trashing the trophy because her, her professional brand started to change and she lost her values. I can't unring that bell. I can't take that scenario back. And so that became part of me. So then it was like, oh, here comes the UCLA champions and there's the poor sport head coach. And I could not un I could not unring that bell. So, and you know, sports, those of you that know sports, you know the fans are very unforgiving. So every stadium I would go to, the fraternities were there with their trash cans. Go Jan Quest! Hit us. I mean, it was just a horrible lesson. And then I had to relive it. And I always like to share that with younger men and women because you're gonna have bell ringing, bell ringing opportunities. I'm going to ask you to just pause and say, is this the right decision in the moment? And may you always take the high road because I didn't take the high road on that day. And so that was a fork in the road for me. And I realized I needed to step back, reevaluate, go back to my values, go back to my processes, who I am, how I do my work and let results take care of themselves. Let's get back to working hard, staying positive, mastering failure recovery, and just being able to be grateful and aware that my job as a leader is going to be creating the conditions for my students to be the best version of themselves. And I do that in a transformative way. And the principles around transformative um, coaching is that the student athlete and the teacher, the coach, are actually going through the learning process together. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the lesson here is don't turn into a faker. Don't turn into something bigger than you are because the game is giving you a lot back. We were getting lots of W's. We were getting lots of W's. You're going to get a lot of W's in your life, no matter what you do. If you're in marketing or you're in management or you're in sales or you're a teacher or a lawyer, whatever it is, screenwriter, you're going to have moments where you're going to be in a cross, at a crossroads. And I'm going to, hopefully I can stain your brain and go, man, I don't want to be like Sue Enquist, man. She never, she never got to let go of that. So um, that's the main thing I'm going to share with you on that, that life lesson, uh, Jim, around um, being, a, being a great professional means hunkering down to your foundation, no matter how successful you are. And for me, it's, it's also being surrounded by people to help you stay grounded. And so really pick your friends uh, carefully and pick people that will encourage you to be more than you already are, then you've got that built-in guide rail. Jim, right. any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. I mean, I love what you said, you know, as, as your brand changes, your value shouldn't. And I'm sure you've had a front row seat and I'm not asking you for names, but just instances. You've probably seen somebody who's gone from, in all the people you've met, who they've been, they've gone and uh, as a player who ended up, you know, working their way up, the coaching ranks and then they did not succeed because they tried to be somebody else who they weren't well and yeah you're you're absolutely right and what's interesting about personal and professional excellence because we just mm -hmm. crossed over now into professional excellence the world is small mm -hmm. as, as vast as it is the world is small and may you go out every day as though that person that's full of themselves or that colleague that's full of themselves, don't get caught up in the, in the trap of trying to be bigger than the game, bigger than the job, because it can always come back. You never know when these people, these companies will come back and be in, in your sight line again. And so 
be intentional about protecting your excellence because you're going to be surrounded by a lot of people that are negative that are bottom thirds. And um, I'll talk about that when we go into the leadership piece and actually leading teams. I wanna give you some anchor things, um, and whether you're coaching a team or you're uh, coaching colleagues or you get a big job and you're in charge of your own team. I wanna just leave you with some nuggets that hopefully help you become really efficient when it comes to uh, guiding teams to be their best self. Perfect. Great. Uh, before we move on to the next section here, uh, any questions? Any questions from the class? We'll have we'll have room at the end to make a just turn it into kind of a discussion Q and A. But if anybody has any questions before we move on, uh, feel free to chime in. If not, then then go ahead. Yep. I I just want if I've lost you, come back in. If you could just remember this sentence. Championship teams, successful teams are messy. It's, it's a challenge to guide 15 individuals that are, have, that have perfected, have perfected putting themselves first to get them to buy into, I'm gonna ask you to be number two in your own life, two hours every day on the ball field, eight hours every day in your office. And so the idea, Give yourself, give yourself some space and be patient with yourself as a leader that not everybody's going to get it. And I always, when I, when I heard the 33% rule, when I was a young leader, it was a game changer for me because when I first started to bring groups together as a leader, I would go nutso that there were people that didn't follow, that didn't get it. I took it personally, young leaders, when you're, followers don't follow you, you take it personally. Then you get emotional, then you become a distraction. So young leaders, be patient, understand the 33% rule. There's a third of the people in your life, in your family, in your work, there's a third of the people that will just suck the life out of you. It's like nobody gave them the filter. Like, dude, we're in class right now, so it's not about you and your oh poor me life or your family member. Oh, there's Uncle Hank always whining about the weather and the traffic and the economy. Some people never got the memo around how I think affects how I speak and how I speak affects my actions. Always remember the 33% rule. A third of the people are going to be bottom third. Then you got middle third, they blow in the wind. They're on board when everything is just perfect, but the minute things get hard, oh, he's a terrible leader. We suck, we're terrible. Beginning of the season, honeymoon, everybody loves each other in, in coaching. Then you get in the gut of the season, like, oh, this sucks. Like, they don't know what they're doing. That's middle third, you blow in the wind. And then you have top third, I like to say top 1% on the Zoom, that literally every single day, you can't shake their mindset that at the end of the day, you wanna follow somebody that believes it's gonna get better, believes that the people can get the job done. I never heard an employee say, oh, I can't stand my boss. He believed in us way too much. <laughs> I can't stand my boss. She believed in us too much. And so I'm gonna challenge you as a young leader, be that engineer belief with your fellow employees. See the potential. Because they're never going to go off. He kept saying we were going to win and we didn't win. I couldn't stand playing for him. It's not going to happen. So if you could always remember that 33% rule when it comes to being a leader, it's going to help your team experience overall. There's two really important standardized concepts around culture. Culture, if you could always remember, culture is like a baby. Culture on teams, it's like a baby. It's not, you can't go to an event and make great culture. Any of you play sports like, oh, we're gonna do team bonding. We're gonna go do a military thing. We're gonna carry telephone poles up the hill and make us stronger and more united. Yeah, for the day. What makes great teams are two levers. How we perform together like the stuff we do at the office, how we're actually doing our work, the process, remember character drives process, process 
gets results. We don't control the results. So how we perform together and how we perform together is connected to how we interact as people in our relationship with each other. So there's two levers all the time. And that's why it's so complicated because you've heard about personality profiling. You've heard about talent identification. You've heard about people that are perfectionists. You've heard about people that have anxiety. So this is such a layered challenge as a leader to create great culture. Always remember, if you can see we're breaking down in our process, are we breaking down in how we communicate with each other? And then to pull that onion back, to go deeper into, okay, Sue, so I got it. I see the pillars. How do I do it? I'm going to give you just a high level. Today, to be a transformational leader, it starts with, I'm going to ask everybody in the office, on the team, what's important to you? What's important to you in the relationship side? What's important to you on the performance side? Okay, here are the values. Define those values in the office. That's where people drop the ball. Like, oh, here are our values. You see it in the notebook. You see it on the poster. Here are our values. And they're on the water and it's beautiful. No, I want to know what the values are. I want to know the definition of those values. I want to know where they manifest in the office, on the ball field, in the airport, uh, in the dorms. I want to know exactly what that looks like on the performance and the relationship side push that aside. Now we've taken care of how we enact our values. Now do I have in my great culture, do I have an accountability system? So what are we going to do when people go off the rails? So make sure you have an accountability system. Here's the great thing about being a leader, put it on your people. How do they want to hold those values accountable on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's where there's some leadership technical stuff you need to learn around conflict management, how you, how you agree to disagree. One quick tip, if you ever want to lower the tension in conflict, it's called drop the rope. So in conflict, it's a competition. I'm right, you're wrong. I see it this way, you see it that way. And we're in this tug of war of who's right. If you could remember in conflict, when you know you're gonna go meet somebody in conflict, I want you to say these words, drop the rope of competition and start the sentence with, I'm perceiving, and then fill out the sentence. That person says, and I'm perceiving, perfect. Now, how can I help you perceive something different? Give the example, but you first can't do it. You gotta drop the rope of being competitive when it comes to conflict management. And those are some of the most important things that I really learned when it came to being a leader is I gotta know what our people believe in. Our student athletes built the values. They built the definitions, what they look like. Great culture understands there's two levers, performance and relationships. And then being able to manage conflict and have an accountability system. Um, those are some real critical things that I see when I'm evaluating, I'll go into corporations and evaluate their culture those are the big things that they haven't been able to, to fine tune that I think affects people's um, overall enjoyment of being on a team. You've got to build the conditions where people are valued, celebrate the little things. Unprovoked gratitude is huge. We know everybody gets a prize on their birthday, but what about a little, a little thank you for something that somebody did? Unprovoked gratitude is one of the most powerful forms of gratitude. And today in the digital age, you can do that so easy on your phones, all kinds of apps that you can be dropping gratitude notes to people. So something that I would really encourage you to do around uh, leading teams is people want to go into a group where they see, they feel seen. And and now um, for many of us, uh, you know, I'm I'm a white woman from Orange County. I mean, I'm a woman of privilege. My job isn't just to be an ally to all those that have been underrepresented. My job is to be an advocate. My job is to be a gatekeeper. My job is to make sure everybody is seen and to build those conditions so everyone else can learn that and then they go out and that attitude gets scaled. I don't care what your political persuasion is. It's about valuing people, 
no matter what walk of life they're from. So those are the quick highlights for me, Jim, around leading teams. Perfect. Great. That was, that was, that was incredible. Um, any questions, anybody? Well, quick, quick, quick question before we move on. And if there aren't, that's fine. I don't want to stop Sue's uh, momentum. So uh, this is, um, we're closing up here. Um, this, I call it scorecarding excellence. What does it mean? It means as you get older, you start to know your routine and you can get complacent. And so this is my framework that I use every single week. I'm scorecarding myself and everything that I do to make sure that I'm the best version of myself. And as I told you earlier, sometimes I go off the rails. Like, like I try to be a good eater, um, but I love candy. I'd rather have Swedish fish than you know, a steak. And so I have to constantly keep an eye on my weaknesses, although I say Swedish fish, I'm wondering if that counts as protein. I don't know, Jim. You it know. does. It does. Okay, perfect. Um, but it's a simple framework, scores an acronym. And I start with my thumb and I say, what am I willing to sustain and celebrate getting 1% better each and every day? So what am I going to celebrate? Thumbs up every single day because I got to sustain it. I've got to continually be in motion. I can't sit on my laurels and think I'm bigger than the game, game of excellence. Number two is compete, which means what am I defending? What am I gonna compete for every day? Number one finger, my values come one. My values are number one. The tall finger, the long finger is I gotta stay really organized in my life because I got lots going on. You all have lots going on. How do you stay organized that your priorities are in alignment? And we know when our priorities get out of alignment, let's talk about maybe we're partying too much, we're drinking too much, whatever it may be. We just have to learn, hey, let me look at my organization each and every day. Am I putting the things that are important? Am I demonstrating that in my life each and every day? So stay organized, the middle finger. The ring finger, are we mastering failure recovery? Are we resilient? It's the R. Am I gonna to commit to being first up after failure? The last one is energy. We have quiet leaders. I'm more demonstrative as you can imagine, but society needs to get smarter at celebrating quiet, shy people. Some of the most successful people in society. We know that Harvard Review did a big leadership study, thousands of CEOs. And we know the majority of people that get to the top are more quiet and are more introverted than they are extroverted. So energy means connection. So if you're shy, just make sure you're making connections. If you're an energy person and you're the positivity train, that's great. But we've got to be able to bring the energy each and every day. It doesn't have to be loud. It could be loud or quiet around connection. So what do I celebrate? What, do I, what are my values, number one? How do I stay organized? What, what am I going to do to make sure that I'm resilient each and every day? And then bringing energy. So that's my framework. I ask you, what's yours? And so that will be your homework is to how do you set a framework where you're checking yourself as you continue to get successful. And so you don't get compliant, complacent in that area. Jim? That is great. That is great. Um, all right, now let's just, we can just turn this into a conversation, just the class and you, correct? Yes. Well, okay. and if you want, Jim, I wanna, in closing, I, oh, sure. I'm going to, I'm gonna just send oh. this deck to you, Jim. And Perfect. then if they ever want it, they can have it. And then I also wanted to just do this quick video, but I want to be sensitive. When is class? Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. We have, we still have uh, plenty of time. We do? When is class yeah. over? At uh, 5.15. Oh, perfect. So this video is in honor of all of you, where sometimes in life, you kind of feel like you're the ball boy or the ball girl, that you're on the fringe and you're not included. And may this be a visual and inspiration that each and every day, just keep climbing the wall and be the one, no matter where they put you in the line, no matter where they put you in the company, no matter what you're doing in your internship, be the one that gets the job done. This is in honor of all of you.
Three balls and a strike to count to Brent Johnson. One out, top of the seventh inning. Fresno two, Tacoma one. Santos in a jam. Johnson, his first year at AAA from the city deal. That swung on and driven deep down the left field line toward the corner, and this ball is going to be. Jake Wald in left field can't believe it. And look, she shows him up. She just sort of tosses him the ball, saying, take that, Jake. I don't see you making the effort. Alfonso, the catcher, he can't believe it. Let's look at that replay. Oh, my. What an amazing play. And now look at her sitting there saying, no big deal. So that's, that's your visual of how agile you are, your vertical lift, your ability to get the job done. That's your visual. So hopefully I've stained your brain, Jimmy. Love it. Um, all right, let's turn it uh, turn it over to the class. Uh, any questions? I got a few questions. I could kind of uh, I like Maggie put in a comment. Energy vampires. Those are those bottom thirds or B threes, right? Yes, B three yes. we call them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, does anybody have any questions? This is just an open conversation. It's very rare you can get somebody like Sue uh, and uh, in a class. I have a question. Go for it. Um, okay, so I'm Brooke. I'm also a sophomore screenwriting major. And when you started talking about quiet leaders, I'm a very quiet and observant and shy person. And I've always allowed myself to be a follower just because that's what I've always known and I'm comfortable there. But I recently started working on set as an assistant director, which I would argue is more of a leader than the director themselves. Um, and I guess my question is, how do I transition from being a follower to a leader while still like being quiet, I guess? It's a, well, first of all, for a quiet person to ask a question, first of all, thank you, baby steps. Um, I'm gonna share with you something. All you, the leader is already in you. You're now gonna pull out what's already there. Great leaders care. So Brooke, when you're going to be in a leadership position, everyone's society thinks it's about having all the answers. No one's asking the leader to have all the answers. Everyone's just saying, do you see me and do you care about me? And so every day, Brooke, when you start your new leadership position, when you open that knob, what do my people need? Say to yourself, how am I showing them I care? So that, that character skills awareness and then work ethic, right? Because people that care, they do a lot of work. And at the end of the day, always create the conditions for, for feedback. So maybe once a week, you're going to have, you know, uh, something about some, you know, time with Brooke, right? Feedback with Brooke, Fridays at four. How can I get better for you guys? Because, or gals, people want leaders that care. People want leaders that see everybody and value everybody. And, you know, when I coached, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because even in your world, a director on set, how important is the boom operator, right? Like nobody normally sees the boom operator. But if you literally took one little piece out of any of it, it throws everything off. So what am I doing to pay attention and thank all the thankless positions? Every single day I try to find my 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th player to find them and just say, thanks for picking us because they were walk-ons, right? And I'm gonna challenge you to do that. Think about there's all the big people, but what about all the little jobs? What about the, the ball girls and the ball boys in your world? And so as a leader, that's gonna be a game changer. They're gonna go, ooh, we want Brooke. We need her to be now, go ahead and handle this studio. So Brooke, we'll be following you in your ascension when you're like running Sony Studios or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, Brooke. <laughs> She's got it, Brooke. Brooke, thank you so much for asking that question. It took a lot of courage to answer the question. And they go, look at the applause, look at the positivity in the chat. It says, go Brooke, woo. Yeah, Brooke. You, you got this, Brooke. Yeah, you Brooke, awesome. get everybody a job, Brooke. <laughs> alumni no take care of their own. Create the bubble, Brooke, no pressure. I right. Know. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, anybody else? All right. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Chime in. Yeah, I'd love to ask a question, actually. My name is um, Axel Stone. I am a junior uh, communication major with an entrepreneurship minor. And when you said drop the rope, 
<sighs> I have trouble doing that. So if you could just elaborate on like some tips to, you know, drop the rope figuratively. Axel, I wish I could tell you like, oh, when I heard that, I became like perfect. I was a nightmare. I was like hanging on to that rope for life. What was a game changer for me was I'm going to challenge all of you to start small. So Axel, I'm going to have you think right now of some of the things that make you want to stick a pencil in your eye. It could be the people, it could be the relationship. What is it? Give me that scenario right now. If we could just throw it out and we'll role play right now. I mean, off the top, ugh. does it have to be professional or can it be kind of like friendship oriented? It can be, it can be anything that's under your fingernails. Anything that you're just like, ugh. you know, people that just in conversation, they make like unsolicited jokes and stuff. I don't know why that bugs me so much. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so when you say it out loud, it's kind of funny. It lands on everyone. like, yeah, joke. but Axel, let me share with you. It drives me nuts. So that people never got the memo. Let us get off the fricking elevator, you idiot. Like that was my experience. When I first heard that, I'm like, I'm gonna try it there. Just drop the rope, don't, don't get heightened. If you try it with something little and you're like, whoa, that felt pretty good. So I'm gonna challenge you to take your little tensions, start there, and as you get better at it, I. I heard a, a saying, uh, it's called the five by five. It's, it's the first cousin to drop the rope. The five by five, is this gonna matter in five hours, five days, five weeks, five months, five years? And you rarely can say yes to all of them, right? So those two are like first cousins to each other, but I'm gonna start with little things and then build on it and watch what happens. It'll be, you'll be amazed at how much uh, the tension just, you won't be on the edge as much when you start to let go of those things. I like that five by five by five rule. That's something I'm definitely going to implement. Thank yes. you. Yes. Great question, Axel. Uh, great questions, class. Keep, keep them coming. Feel free. Anybody? I'm going to ask a question. The question slash comment slash maybe get, get into your head a little bit. So you retired at UCLA, you're 49 years old, correct? Yes. Okay. And for all of you, all the students here, that seems like a, like a reason that you're really old. You're not. Um, you're, and, and realistically in coaching, some are just hit their stride. Some are just getting started. You were at the top of your game. You retire. I should probably stand up to that. That's not the case. Oh no, oh, you can see this. Um, I'm in the one, the, 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 the one sport box there. Um, you were at the top of your game and you retired and I'm sure people thought, look at how much, look how many wins and how many uh, opportunities you left on the table. But I know that you probably thought you, you could impact more potentially away from the game and do bigger things. Can you kind of walk us through that decision, the, the process, the decision and how comfortable you were just walking away as like, I mean, did you see my softball is the, the biggest program in the sport, in that sport? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna high level it. Uh, I, as the head coach, we had won when I was a good coach. We had won when I was a crappy coach. I learned so many lessons that I stopped getting curious about what else I could do within this environment. And I started to get more curious about could I help the youth industry, youth sport industry, and could I help the leadership industry around using the principles that I learned in sport into corporate America? I had no exit strategy. My athletic director thought that I was gaming him around getting a bigger, a bigger paycheck. Um, you know, the greatest compliment as a coach is when your AD says, name your price. Um, but I'm not motivated by money. So that meant nothing. I said, no, I have no exit strategy, but I, I'm more curious about, can I start over and create a brand around helping you softball? And so the moral of that story is I went back to my values. 
I said, it's my effort, my attitude. I'm going to master failure recovery. I'm going to drop the rope of tension of not being as great at something. I've got to put my ego on the shelf because I'm starting over. And I absolutely loved it. And it worked really well for me to be able to, to do those things. And um, I want to share with you an important story around that. Whenever you're asked um, in your career that maybe you have to take a shift, it always comes back to how you treat people. And I can remember I wanted to help out our Olympic team. I was retired and our Olympic team was, they were cat fighting. So they had called and they said, coach, can you help us be the umpire? Cause we're cat fighting. And I said, you're cat fighting around who stays pro and who goes amateur. And let's have an event and let's bring everybody together that has different ideas around leadership in these Olympians. And I said, I'll help you. And they're like, coach, you're going to do the event. I'm like, yeah, I got caught up in the moment. I didn't know anything about an event. I never knew anything about how to run an event. I'm a softball coach. I got off the phone and I thought, what did I just get myself into? And I remember talking to my brother who was very successful in corporate America. He says, Sue, you have so many relationships. I have no doubt. I go, no, I seriously, I, I said, I'm going to do the whole thing. Long story short, we put on a national leadership event in, in for Olympic softball. And I was able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars in like 90 days by one simple thing. I'm gonna call the people that were my friends in the sport. And so why do I share that with you? At the end of the day, it's just, you're gonna feel better in your heart. You're gonna have less anxiety in your brain by making more friends than enemies, no matter where you are on the food chain. And I always remember my mom, she always said that life is more enjoyable when you can see the positive in people, even in their worst moment. And it, it worked out really well. I left, I left the industry super happy. And when you can leave the industry after 37 years with your I was still in love with it as much the last day as I was the first day. So I encourage you to remember how you treat people is so critically important in your ascension to being great. That's great. That's awesome. Um, one last question before Sue, I mean, we could stay here for hours, but one last question before uh, we let Sue go and think, I mean, we, I, could, I could ask you questions for you know days. Um, if nobody has a question, I do have one. So, but but please, I'm sure you're probably tired of listening to me. We're in the 14th or 15th week of this class. So, uh, anybody have have a question? Um, I have a question. Go for it. Okay, so um, my name is Quinn. I'm a graphic design major and business minor. And I have like two. It's like a two part question. One, I was just wondering what you think. Um, like the the plus sides or ways I can like pitch myself as a, cause I'm not sure what I want to do with my career yet, but something involved with both um, subjects for sure. So how can I, uh, however, I'm more creatively inclined. So how can I market myself like that in like a business situation? And two is um, how important do you think connections are uh, in terms of like business connections strictly or more like marketing, graphic design, artistic connections? Well, Quinn, that's, it's a really good question. N number one, um, graphic design is such a huge industry with lots of options. I want you to look at your world, your industry. You know more about it than any of us on this Zoom. The number one thing I want you to ask you, I want you to check all the areas that you've asked yourself this question. Would I do this for free if I could? Oh, hell no. No, nope, don't put that one. Would I do this? Oh, yes. Would I do this? Yes, 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 yes. Now you've fine tuned it down to maybe your top three to five things in graphic design. The second thing I would do is the alumni rating of Chapman University is one of the highest in the country. So I'm asking you, Quinn, to make sure that you get in a part of every career networking because in this world we're in, Quinn, Sooner or later, somebody needs a creative. I don't care if it's the first hour or the last hour. Somebody needs a creative. You are our storytellers. You are our picture board makers. You are the brand 
clarifiers. It's such an important job. And I hope in your heart, you never say, well, I'm just a designer. Everybody on this Zoom have to eliminate that word just. I'm just a screenwriter. I'm just a softball coach. I'm just uh, a graphic designer. So uh, Quinn, I'm excited for you because this industry is now gone to, it's gone in all different directions because of digital, right? So my whole life I grew up, it was just print. That's it. Now you've got all kinds of options around that. So I get excited for you. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Great. I guess we could squeeze in one more question. If somebody wants one more question and holding something back. Go oh, it's it. too bad. We were going to give $500 on that question, Jen. I know. What a bummer. A bummer. I, had it all. I, had, I had the gift card right here in my, my jacket pocket. Oh, geez. That's too oh, nice. um, Well, Sue, thank you so much for your time. I can't thank you enough. This has been great. Um, I know the class, you know, thoroughly enjoyed this. I can, I can kind of see you kind of see me in that one box. Um, and uh, contact information. Do you have any? Did you want to uh, yeah. leave any contact? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I always do this. I always put this in the chat. So you guys have it. And just put me in your back pocket always. All right. There's my personal cell phone. And um, if you ever need anything, I'm there for you. Uh, I love helping leaders um, get more clarity around their own values. And more importantly, I just love uh, supporting uh, your journey. Won't be easy, right? but be the one in the room that raises your hand that says, I can. Even if you don't totally have it figured out, I tell people just raise your hand. People want hard workers that figure stuff out. When you get in that interview, think about the framework. Maybe that scorecarding acronym works for you. Oh, I can't stand interviews. Think about scorecarding, attach a story to each pillar. You'll kill the interview and, and spend a lot of time on failure recovery and initiative. When I interview middle managers and CEOs, they're looking for people that are gonna take initiative. We're lacking that um, in this generation right now. I'm a big millennial fan. I like all the stuff you know, and we just have to do a better job of seeing you and supporting you. But one thing you do wanna work on is take initiative, raise your hand and lean in and say, I can do that, I'll go get it. I don't really know, but I'll figure it out. Be that person and you'll set yourself uh, ahead in the long run. There's no doubt about it. You're better than you think. You're better than you think. High performers are always uber critical of themselves. The average people, they're so full of themselves. I mean, how hard is it to sit on the couch? They're so full of themselves. High performers are uber critical, always have a low burn going of anxiety. That's okay. That's energy. Start worrying when you're like, I'm good. I don't need to do anything. Good luck, everybody. It's fun spending the day with you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. Thank I you, Sue. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. Oh, yeah. Quick, quick secret. Jimmy, Jimmy is my nephew-in-law. <laughs> bye, Jim. Love, love, love you. Love bye, you. bye, bye, bye. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, let me stop recording. I should have stopped recording right before.